We're doing it. Matt Dodge, welcome to the new studio. Can you believe it? I love it. It's beautiful. I'm stoked. You were here when we when I first purchased this house and it was not like this. Isn't it crazy to see how far it's come in, let's say, six months? I mean, I'm looking at a pool table, a beautiful red felt pool table, just the, the greenery in here, the whole setup. It, it hits well. I like it. So in when I first moved to Miami, I was living with my buddy Chris. After three months, I got an apartment and about seven months in, uh, your wife, Haley, told me she had an incredible property she wanted me to look at. I broke my lease. I went and purchased that property. That was my first, essentially, entrance into real estate. And it's all thanks to you and Haley's guidance. Uh, real estate is amazing, especially here in Miami. If you pick the right location, you can't go wrong with it. I actually remember your um, your apartment, though. Wow. Wasn't that so pimp? It was, it was like a studio ready for beautiful art. You know, it was just floor to ceiling glass, super cool. But I mean, both houses that you have are even better now. So, but what's great about the house specifically that we're in now is it's a tool. It's yep. a tool for growing. It's a tool for building the studio. It's a tool for uh, making art, and and art for me is podcasting. It's doing super fun ice baths with my friends in the backyard. <laughs> we got all sorts of fun cigar stuff going on in the in the in the garage. So I think it's important to be able to have a space you can create in. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, and what's nice about this house in particular is you get a ton of great light. You're in an awesome location, super walkable. You're close to some of the restaurants that Citadel and things like that, which is really great. I know you've had a few of the guests on. So for everyone that doesn't know, Matt Dodge, CEO and founder of cigars.com. Myself, co-founder of cigars.com. We got Sky Warren check over there. He is Mr. Does It Everything. He's phenomenal. And this is the gang. This is the boys. We're taking over B2B cigars, coming to a corporate event near you. What a journey it's been. And it, it feels like it's been freaking, it's whipped by. I'm trying to, so I think we started originally in like October or November of 2022, right? Or 2021. It, it's only been... It's been less than two years. It has flown by. And we have had, I mean, the best year so far of the company's life. And it's been a lot of fun. It's been a lot of fun. But what I think has been so interesting is that we, we didn't plan on doing it. I think with a lot of different people in my life, I've had conversations where I imagined doing business with at some capacity or maybe joking around about starting something or talking about something. I've never in my life talked to you about doing a business together. And I've also never done a business with anybody else either. Like I've started businesses in the past and it's been kind of a, a you know, a sole proprietorship or a single thing, right? Where it all falls on me. So it's, you know, it was, it was, it was difficult and tough, but it, it made a whole lot of sense, especially with someone like you. I've known you my whole life, you know? It makes things a little easier. It does make it easier. But they say you should not get into business with your friends. What do you think about that? Well, I don't consider you just my friend. I think that's the biggest thing. I mean, you knew me. I, I'm, so I was in the second grade when I moved to Loudonville. So you were in, God, what would that be? Pre, Pre-K, pre right? Um, for pre you. Pre-K, that's crazy. So, uh, and I've known you since then at the old house in, in Loudonville and into the new house in Loudonville and... Um, shout out the loft. Yeah. And the loft. I mean, we had amazing ideas. So it's, I think it's don't do business with like your, your, your friends in a sense, like maybe people who don't actually know who you are fully. I mean, you've seen me grow up, you know, you've seen me mature. You've seen me in professional settings before we even started doing business. I mean, essentially we knew each other for 25 years before we even got into business together. It's very true. And our first business venture was slinging, Soda and water at the Valley Cat Stadium. Well, that taught me so much. My first job there, I actually was the one who was doing the hot dogs. And then half, half the you season what, in. 15, 16, 17? I might have even been less. I might have been 13 or 14 when I was doing the hot dogs. Um, and yeah, I, I would say like half the season in, the boss... He was leaving. I think he got like an early scholarship or something and he had to go play. It was baseball or something and he had to go to college and leave early. So he said, you want this position? And that's managing all of those vendors, right? So from there, I moved into that. And then you came on, uh, I think maybe just a couple years later and you started just, 
absolutely crushing soda and water. I mean, how heavy was that? So for everyone that doesn't understand, the Valley Cats is a, what was it, Division Three? what is it, Triple A? Single A, Single Houston a. Astros. So it's still a big deal, you know? Um, and we had some really good players come through there. Jose so it's, Altuve. A, it's a baseball stadium, and we're young, trying to make some money. Matt recommends me to get this job. Devin worked there, that's what. Devin worked there. And he was doing beer. Yes. And beer was where the money's at. I actually never did beer. Josh Kenyon did the beer. Yes, he did. But But soda was popular, too. So I would go up and down the alleys with a bright shirt saying, get your soda and water here. Get your soda and water. And I remember every time I did it, I was just, oh, I got to do this again. I made fun with it, but it was a lesson of, I mean, you're so young that y- you fit into the role, but you have to con- hype yourself up before you do it because it's, you're putting yourself out there. But the fun thing about that exercise is I personally remember learning that people don't care people mm-hmm. don't care about you're not at the top of their mind but people think that, that you're at their top of their mind but the truth is people just want some soda and water potentially absolutely a, a lot of times you probably hear this with entrepreneurs a lot they say like one of the best jobs you can do is be a server or a waiter right i think this is taking that to a totally different level because the, it, it, being a server or a waiter you go to that person's table. You're assigned to that person's table, right? But when you're vending and you're selling soda and water, you're going up and down the alleys, uh, aisles, excuse me, um, around the entire thing. You're filling up. You're 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 carrying. It had to be 80, 90 pounds, and none of those were ever new. They were always drenched. There was always some something broken on it and it would get you soaking wet incentivize you to sell because you wanted it to be lighter exactly you would always come back when they'd be warm right and ask for colder ones right we'd always be switching you know but the customer service that matters you know you didn't want to give anyone a a warm soda i used to get so excited when i would sell at least enough that i could go back and say hi to you yeah and you were always hustling you had all that whole section under control you were homies with everyone in the different places everyone looked up to you and respected you which is what ultimately I looked up to you and respect you. And I still do today. And I, that's the foundation that has led to this beautiful business, which is cigars.com. And it's been so fun because like you mentioned, successful for everyone that doesn't know, Matt Dodge, I'm just going to hype you up real quick. NFL and UFC sports agent started your own sports agency, ran it for multiple years, signed multiple athletes, you had one of the coolest pitches to get your foot in the door. We're going to talk about that in a sec. And you did that all yourself. And I remember watching and following that journey. You were on the podcast. We talked about the journey. Mm-hmm. Cigars wasn't even a thing back then. And so much has changed now. And it's been so fun combining both of our talents with Sky and the rest of the team to build this really fun idea of reimagining cigars, making cigars fun, making them unique, making them customized, making them feel special. And ah, it's been, it's so much fun, man. I mean, what a cool industry you're you, so, you know, any, any like tech entrepreneur, what they're always looking for is a, a market that they can disrupt. Right. Right. Um, cigars was like the most ripe for disruption. It's the oldest, classiest kind of antiquated industry that really I've ever been a part of and just doing a few of the things that that we've learned over the years and kind of um, moving that into cigars has has taken has, has has allowed us a position in the sandbox here and it's been a lot of fun because we've got so many unique ideas we've been able to execute on a few and we're going to be doing a whole lot more let's talk about what we like about cigars so personally, one thing I think is very interesting is the world is obsessed with something called vaping, mm-hmm. right? I don't know much about vaping. I personally, I've done it a few times when I've had a few drinks with friends and they have it because it just, it's there. Never really felt like addicted to it, but I know so many people that are addicted to it. It's this silent addiction that no one really talks about, but everyone's vaping. What I like about a cigar is that I don't know anyone that's addicted to cigars, And for anyone listening to this podcast, drop in the comments if you know someone that's truly addicted, right? And we're not, we're talking addicted. So if someone's addicted to cigarettes, they're leaving the room every hour and a half to go smoke a cig or bum a cig or whatever it is. You don't see that with cigar smoking. Some people smoke two or three cigars a day for sure. 
and maybe that's pushing it. <laughs> but the reality is, is I don't know anyone that does it. And I don't like playing around with things that are very addictive. Yeah. You know, people assume that we sell cigars, that we smoke cigars all the time, which is not the case. I smoke maybe a cigar twice a week. And I look forward so much to that opportunity to smoke a cigar because it's an opportunity to connect, de-stress, and just relax with a friend. And you can also smoke them by yourself, but I truly personally love smoking with someone else because I just feel dialed. I feel like I'm locked in. What are your thoughts? Uh, perfectly said. Um, and I think you don't see the addictive nature in tobacco and cigars in particular because one of the things I like most is that it is an investment of your time, right? Compare vaping, cigarette smoking, and cigars, right? A vape, you can take a couple of hits and you're good, right? Seconds, a cigarette, minutes, a cigar, an hour or more, right? So you're not going to be addicted to something or as often addicted to something if it takes you that much time and when you're investing your time in it. When you're lighting that cigar, you're not thinking about putting it out. You're thinking about smoking it and enjoying a conversation. Last night I had one alone and it was amazing. I, you know, the, it was a, it was pouring rain in Miami and then it opened up and I walked outside and I, I lit one up and I could see the sky open up and just allowed me to kind of think, reflect on the day, reflect on the week and just gave me what I needed. It took time for myself, for my mental health. Right. right? And to be clear, I think neither of us are vouching that smoking cigars is good for you. There is a, a lot of word though that it boosts your testosterone. Yeah, there is. Yeah. No, I mean, it's a, it's a Mayo Clinic study. I mean, there's, there's, there is plenty of studies, uh, highly reputable studies that show that. Um, but I think we've talked about this before, but for those who are listening, like there are a lot of worse vices. If you have something that you want to enjoy occasionally, right? Whether that be, you know, a bourbon or a scotch or a cigarette or a vape or something, you know, I think there are worse things than a cigar, right? you know? Yeah, that's very true. And the interesting thing about vices is that they sneak up on you. And I like what you mentioned about the fact that when you smoke a cigar, it's an hour of your time. So mm -hmm. you really have to plan it out. It's not something you just rip up real quick and can get that quick hit. You need to plan out a cigar smoking. So you need to be in the right environment. You need to have certain tools to use it. And what's interesting is I'm drinking a cup of coffee right now. Mm -hmm. And I was having a lot of gut issues. And it was actually my friend Laza who mentioned that coffee is another one of those silent vices that get caught up in your life that you find yourself drinking two or three cups a day sometimes. But if you stop altogether, you get rid of that caffeine buzz that you need and crave. What happens is if you lose sensitivity to the actual effects of caffeine, when you stop drinking caffeine for let's say three days to a week, when you do finally drink a cup of coffee, woo, yeah. you get you get energized, you get jolted, you, you feel it. And ideally with vices, we treat all vices like that. It's once in a while. Imagine in a perfect world, Monday through Friday, you're eating healthy, you're eating whole foods, you're eating, you're drinking the juices, you're staying away from all the, the heavy carbs and all the junk food or the American diet, if you would. But then a few days a week or Saturday or Sunday or just one day, you pig out, you eat the pancakes, you eat the French toast, you destroy the bathroom, you do all of these things. Ideally, that's how life works, but it typically doesn't work like that. Sometimes, you know, you, we, there's this amazing pasta place called Borti Love Borti. here at the Citadel in Miami, sh uh, Miami Shores. Wow. Borti's, uh, Borti's one of the best Italian spots there is. So I know Sky loves Borti. Love Borti. It might be the best <laughs> spot there. Um, but then every time I do that, I always end up getting the bread and then the bruschetta and then sometimes the... USBS? Well, you know, the dessert. Donut pasta. The tiramisu. No, the tiramisu. Oh, the tiramisu. <laughs> you can't forget about that. Well, for my birthday, Sky got me two sheets of the tiramisu. Wow. That was an addiction. <laughs> that was an addiction. It was bad. It was actually a really shitty thing because <laughs> yeah. that night we probably ate three to four pieces each and typically uh, pieces two by two. So, I mean, I smashed easy a four by four, mm -hmm. which is like maybe, maybe six by six. And then again, the next day, because you say, well, we got to eat it to finish it off. Yeah, you do. 
can't let it go to waste. Here's an interesting thing. Have you ever found yourself in a position where you've eaten bad food? I mean, this is the start of an eating disorder, but I've done this many times <laughs> with something really bad. I'll put it in my mouth. I'll start chewing it. I'll eat it. I'll, I'll, you know, I'm feeling all the goodness and the richness just moisturing my mouth. And then I just kind of spit it out. I, I've never done that. Um, but it, I'm sure it is a start. Of I've done that. I'm yes. Like, <laughs> but my thought process there is it's never too late to not completely fuck up. It's never too late for anything. Like you have to have that positive mentality on anything, right? Whether it's food or not. Right. And even if you did eat it, it's never too late to go out there and work out and be like, oh, you know, I feel like I, I shouldn't have done that, but let me go work out and let me make up for it. Because sometimes when I find myself feeling bad about myself, because I, sometimes I just get in, I get in funks like crazy. I'm, I'm one of those people that's super high energy and mm -hmm. people that are super high energy see yeah. it on both sides. And sometimes I'm super hard on myself. But when I get out of a funk and I do something so simple, like I find myself screwing up, but I stop. Mm -hmm. halfway you can stop halfway you don't need to finish you can just stop <laughs> you found yourself just yesterday we were we were talking about a cigars initiative for you and um and you found yourself an hour in and didn't accomplish anything and you said wait maybe there's a better I can, maybe i can work smarter here before you put another three hours in there you know it's never too late so true working smarter not harder i think the biggest thing i've learned at this stage of my life going through the different startups and we've both been involved in startups is people that run companies and build businesses and have time work smarter, mm -hmm. not harder. It's not always, you know, putting in hours and hours of work in. it's figuring out a way to do it more effectively, which is interesting with the AI craze now, because almost everything can be automated at some level. But one thing that cannot be automated is relationships. And something I've learned a lot about relationships is from you. I think that there is no one on the planet better at crafting emails and responses to people in a more precise and concise way than you. And I'm curious, where did you learn this ability to communicate so effectively and clearly? Yeah, I mean, I think it goes back to my early days as a sports agent. Um, I represented my first athlete at 18 that my athlete that I represented was older than me, right? So immediately you're in this you know, this disadvantage because you don't get the respect because you're younger. So what you end up having to do is you have to end up communicating as effective as possible in the least amount of time, time as possible, right? Because you're not provided as many opportunities when you're younger. Age it, it, it's used against you a lot, and it was used against me in sports agencies. So for me, it was about how can I get my point across, get my ask in, in the least amount of time. And if I could accomplish all three of those things, then I've accomplished what I needed to do with that time. And right? specifically because you mentioned that previously that sports agents can be some of the worst people. <laughs> yeah. I mean, back then I didn't know that. Back then I thought it was fun. I thought it was cool. You see Jerry Maguire, you see The Rock on TV, right? And you think it's all fun and dandy and you just collect paychecks. It's not like that. Um, not like that at all. So you do have to stand out. You do have to make sure that you you know, you have integrity and that whatever you say that you back it up, you know, that you stay true to your word. What was the hardest part about building that? Because, and, and I also think it would be interesting to tell the origin story of how you got your foot in the door as a sports agent. Yeah. Uh, so no one, again, back to age, no one took me seriously. I called all the agents, um, told them all that, you know, I'm this this hungry, ambitious person who's willing to work for free, willing to, to intern and work for free. Um, but there was a lot around the corner from people who had law degrees, business degrees, you know, people who were in getting their masters, things like that. Right. So why me at that point? Um, so I knew I needed to be a little strategic, a little creative. And I called an agent in New York, uh, got to the receptionist, said that I was an athlete, said that I was a quarterback in the university of Connecticut, um, gave some stats, which were all bullshit um but gave me the opportunity to get on with the agent right which was hard in the first place like i could never even get past their gatekeepers a lot of times and this was my opportunity so as soon as he got on i immediately told him who i was and i wasn't that quarterback right because 
you don't want to you don't want to lead with you know deception necessarily this was my way in right um and he appreciated it he paused at first but then appreciated it and then offered me uh an internship in in new york city and i worked there for two and a half years and that's where i managed my first guy I love that story because that's also how I got my foot in the door with Trueface. I remember. I reached out to Sean Moore. It was just Sean and Azar. And I said, you know, my name is Ian. This is what I've done. I would love to get, learn the startup grind and I'll work for free. Like, what can I do? He said, we were not looking for anyone, but here's a task. And I crushed the task and that led to the thing. More people need to use that philosophy. That's got to be one of the biggest life hacks. If you're a young person, let's imagine you're in 13 to 18 or you're in college, you reach out to a business owner or someone of successful nature and you say that, hey, I will work for free because you want to learn the business. Yeah. You will get the you will get an opportunity. If you do that long enough, you'll get an opportunity. And the hardest thing is getting an opportunity, is getting yourself in front of people that can teach you hard skills that lead towards building value and building equity and building understanding and knowledge. Because it's interesting to me too, how this is a huge pivot, generational wealth mm -hmm. and how a lot of these families that have generational wealth continue to have more and more wealth passed on. And which is interesting because generational wealth, the more I'm learning and the more I'm, I'm listening is more education and successful people and parents pass on education to their children and to their affiliates and their friends. Education is the most important because a lot of this stuff is doable. But then the second part of that is believing that you can do it. Mm -hmm. So when you work for someone for free and you go through an opportunity where you start to work for any sort of company, eventually you find yourself in a position where you say, wait, I can do this too. I can play the role as the CEO or I can play the role as the chief revenue officer or I can play the role as the marketing guy. You find those two things, you're in a deadly position. Yeah. I mean, the education you're alluding to is literally on the job education. I mean, that's it's 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 understanding what it takes to be successful. It's not formal education. I actually not even a huge, huge believer in formal education. I'm about to have a baby. Um, and Congratulations. My, thank you. My wife and I were even talking about this. We're like, you know, when he's at that age where he's ready to go to college, let's just put sports aside because if there's sports, then he can, you know, maybe get a scholarship and go do it for free, right? But let's just say that's not <laughs> part of it. Um, do we want to invest $50,000, $40,000 a year in the formal education system today or do we want to give him that money in some capacity to go learn something right take that and go travel to spain and learn spanish or take that and start a business maybe he loves lawn mowing lawns on the side. buy summers, your first property right or buy your first property right or buy a car put some work into it and flip it make a profit right those kinds of things so we were just talking like should we give him the opportunity or you know will formal education come a long way in the next 15 to 18 years we'll see in 18 years though <laughs> i don't i don't know what's gonna college is gonna look like I, right. Will it be free? Will it be subsidized by the government? Will Will it be on the moon? Will it be? <laughs> because with the student debt crisis, I mean it. Yeah. It's a broken system. Everyone knows it now. People have woken up to the fact that it's a broken system. It's a business. They want to put butts in seats. And I was speaking today to one of my good friends, and I'm going to leave his name out, but he mentioned that there was a 16% interest on a student loan. 16%. That's that's predatory. So you look at a more you look at a mortgage, a standard home mortgage today. Right now I think it's hovering around 7 to 8%. And that's substantial. Obviously our parents were seeing 10%, but the houses were, you know, 120th the cost. Right. But that's crazy. It's predatory. And like that can't that can't we can't keep that up, you know. Someone's got to do something about that. So what happens if people just don't pay their student loans long term? Do they just forgive it? It seems now, like that's kind of can the Can I tell you what ends up happening to it? It goes to your next of kin. So like, let's say something happens to you and you're, you're no longer around, right? Um, if you have your mom or dad, that debt falls to them. It's crazy. It's so crazy that something like that 
and I'm sure there's probably some more facts that we missed, right? Because mm-hmm. we're just two dudes talking. But it's so crazy that something so absurd like that isn't talked about enough. I know. Well, and then the societal pressure when you're a junior in high school and you're just trying to go to a cool college, right? You got all the different cliques and the people and you got the smart people and taking A+. plus. What was the super smart a- class? AP. AP. Those people rolling around thugging Ivy League homies. I know. Kids that already had like their commitment letters. But you're so trying. I remember you felt lost when you didn't have a acceptance letter to college. What, what are you going to do? You felt embarrassed. There was pressure yeah. to do that. To base, There's pressured, society pressured you to spend $50,000 a year with a crazy potential interest on that. And then it pressures you to get an advanced degree after that if you're not moving up the corporate ladder. You know? I mean, Devin, my brother, officially a surgeon, by the way. I know. Ch- Ch- I mean, Devastate 518. I mean, that's, let's go. That's, that's amazing. But Devin's been, Devin's my older brother, for anyone that doesn't understand. Uh, he is, I think he's, I think he's 34 right now. 34. 34. He's my age, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if yeah. he's 35 yet. But he just, he's doing a specialty right now, but he's officially a surgeon. At 34 years old, he's been in college and school for 34 years. Like that's crazy. And it was such a fight. I mean, I remember the Georgetown thing, then, you know, the medical school and getting in and then all of the years you have to spend training behind people that are getting paid. So bravo to him. You got to see it through. And once you do see it through, you know, now he's got a great life ahead of him. He's got a lot of choices. Yeah. And certain careers obviously have higher earning potential, right? But generally speaking, a lot of this debt just kills and cripples people. So going back to our original idea, a better idea would be, hey, I want to work for free. I want to learn how to work with wood. (laughs) I want to become an engineer. Let me learn AutoCAD. Let me go and take some online courses. Let me just go to the school of hard knocks and learn a skill. Yep. If one thing school does give you is a fun experience, that's for sure. Right. And, 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 and it allows you that social component, which is really important in relationships, right? Like you need to know how to talk to your friends. You want to be someone that's likable, right? To all different walks of life, whether it's whatever it is, right? And you need to understand how to effectively communicate to each but one. But you, you learn that almost in, in high school and stuff like that. You don't need college because high school is, I loved high school. I like what I'll say though, we were fortunate enough to go to high school in a very large, pretty diverse high school. True. There are a lot of people who don't, right? A lot of people who are, it's one note, right? It's, it's, and if you're private school or something like that, it might even be worse. So college does blend you, give you that, that kind of blending of that, that maybe you weren't afforded in, in high school. For sure. Yeah. I just exercise my privilege right there. A little bit, but it's okay. I mean, it's my experience. It's your experience and, and you're entitled to that experience, aren't you? But it's interesting because how do you have that experience without needing to go to college? I mean, if you took that money and invested it, you can still have that experience. <laughs> you can yep. still go to spring break with everyone. You just put them in school. <laughs> Very true. But going back I, to what we're doing right now and what you're doing specifically, I want you to explain the story because right now, you know, we're focused on building cigars. You know, we all do a lot of different things as well. And but we've been growing and it's been exciting. And building these relationships that have grown tremendously over the past three to six months even has been amazing. Can you tell the OG origin story of how this whole thing started? Yeah, I mean, we we were smoking cigars, right? And looking around and we were watching Fighting UFC, which we're actually going to be watching tonight, which is going to be a lot of fun. It's in Boston, I believe. It's the Sanhagen font card. Funny enough, one of the guys that's on this card, his name is Dennis, is really good friends and training partners with um, Ally Aquinta. Oh. Ally Aquinta was one of the first cigars that we ever did, right? So we were sitting around watching UFC, and we were like, you know, wouldn't it be cool to to possibly have a business with cigars, and maybe we can involve our dad someday, and maybe they, if they're retired, they could do this on the side. Because we were talking about if... if- our dads are about to retire in mm-hmm. a year, which they have now. What's a business that we could do that we could do with our dads? Cause they live in Albany, New York, and they've worked for the same type of career their entire lives. And they don't know anything different, Yep. but that generation, that's what they did. 
that's what you do in that generation. You work for one company and hopefully you get a pension. They don't invent pensions are no more. That's not a thing. So to us staying in a job for more than two years is very rare, but for them, it's a lifelong commitment. But how do you flip the scripts on doing a big move when you've done something like that? I know. Get them involved in a business. Yeah. Get, get them working. And in high school, I remember smoking cigars with your dad and my dad. Like it was something that we did at kind of a young age, right? So, I mean, it had, it had this authenticity to it that was really, really natural and organic. And then from there, we just said, let's do it. We put $5,000 in a bank account, right? Back then, uh, which was really only less than two years ago. Um, and, and kind of, uh, just made it work from there. And as I mentioned, the Ally Quinto cigar was one of the first ones we ever did. And, you know, I tapped into some of my, my UFC agency, you know, stuff there and the relationships and Al's an amazing guy. Al did a great job promoting the he's cigar. Such a good guy. Such a good guy. And he's so smart too. He yeah. makes it to the top of the UFC. I mean, he, he fought Habib. Fought right? Habib. It was great. And then built an entire life in real estate outside of it. Yep. It's, it's incredible. And now trains and coaches. I mean, he's Sterling. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, exactly. All Joe, the guy that's going to be on this one, Dennis, um, on this card tonight. So yeah. And from there, it was just relationship after relationship, right? Like doing the right thing, putting out a really quality product, coming out with something unique. Not many people did that in the cigar space. They didn't really do these kind of white labeled kind of custom cigars, especially in the athlete world. Uh, and then we, we took that and moved it into some of the charitable aspect with our relationship with Folds of Honor, which has been amazing. Uh, and then from there kind of have moved into making custom cigars for some of the biggest brands in the world. It's amazing. Yeah. It's so crazy how the pivot happened so many times. Yeah. But we weren't afraid of it. Right. It was like what was coming to us. Let's, 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 uh, accept it. Let's, let's try, let's see it through and maybe it'll work and maybe it won't work, but let's not spend too much time on things that don't work. Right. And as a lean startup, right? You need to be down with that type of lifestyle. You need to be open to change. I mean, you've rebuilt our website three different occasions. We're about to do a fourth. We're about to do a fourth. Yeah. <laughs> We're about to do a fourth. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the web, the website stuff is important. It's your first impression, right? Um, and we can only be in front of so many people uh, at once, right? So a lot of the natural organic traffic that comes to our website due to SEO and a lot of the other initiatives that we're doing because we can't do traditional marketing, right? We're a, we're a, a prohibited product or service, right? So, you know, Facebook marketplace, Instagram ads, TikTok ads can't do those. So we need to be really smart and strategic about our SEO and that brings them to a landing page that brings them to a website. So it's really important to have that good first impression because you sometimes only get it once. It made me think about when something I learned working at Trueface is Sean Moore said something once about the nature of startups or it was Sean or Nazar or something I've learned through 500 startups is that most people just give up mm -hmm. well before it ever grows into something. Dave Portnoy with Barstool Sports is one of the best examples ever. I think it was 12 years in before they got any traction, right? But if you are actually here five years from now, chances are that you're going to have a successful business. Absolutely. And I mean, there's been a handful of times where I can understand why people quit, especially in the tobacco world. You know, because there's regulators, there's shipping, you know, issues. There's again, this is a restricted product. You're going to get dropped from a lot of websites and merchants and things like that. So you really have to make sure that you have everything in check and uh, to be able to then ensure you're compliant ensure, ensure you're following every absolutely step. or else you're going to be in trouble and you're going to get shut down and you can't afford to have an e-commerce business not work online right i mean that's our sole thing we started b2c and then we shifted b2b but um we're still completely online driven we don't have a physical location nor do we want to right that's not what what we're doing what we're doing is is much more of the strategy the design the the building of an all-encompassing product and then delivering it to your event i mean so but yeah i mean there, there's uh, there's a handful of times where i could see that you know less um resilient people would have quit i'm learning spanish that's huge i take lessons tuesday thursdays rosalinda is my spanish teacher i met her what did, i met her through some 
website called super something. And then um, we built a relationship. I just recently shouted her out on my Instagram story. She got six new leads. Hopefully wow. some of them converted. She was blown away. She's like, thank you so much. I said, no, thank you because you care so much. Like when I speak to this woman, she kills it every time. Like if I, if I remember, she goes, I'm so proud of you. She's so proud of me. You know, it makes me want to say, learn. say something for us, for us all. Any, anything, say something for well, us in like, Spanish. Como te llamas? Mm, que te, que te gusta hacer? <laughs> I love it. Rock and roll. Listen, it's super important here in Miami, um, in our business. I mean, there's a majority of our tobacco comes from a couple different places, right? Um, all of them Spanish speaking countries. Right. So very important for our, our relationship. Well, that's why I really want to take it serious. Number one, I lived in Medellin for six months and that was such an amazing experience because you need to live in another country and have, it's almost in the, in Europe, for example, and I think it's right before college or after college. They go on holiday and they just spend a year traveling or a certain amount of time period traveling and seeing the world. That's such a cool thing that Europe's got that America doesn't do, you know, tend to do like in terms of an everyday type of thing. And when I was living there, it was just, it opened my mind and my eyes. And there's so much in America that we're so lucky. We're born into such privilege just to be born in America, to have the a, v, a passport that allows you to visit pretty much anywhere without any rules and regulations that I think a lot of America is spoiled at some level. And if they don't believe that, they're not taking advantage of the freedom that America allows, right? And obviously there's problems with America. There's different communities that are underserved that don't have the same liberties. But at the end of the day, freedom of speech and everything that you can do in America is phenomenal. Like it's great. And think about it from a business perspective, right? We can turn around and start this business very, very quickly, right? And be afforded the resources to start an LLC, to, you know, get compliant, to have amazing shipping to all 50 states, right? That's reasonably priced, all of that. You're just trying to start a business in a different country. It would be a lot harder than that. And that's why you need to travel. That's why you need to learn different languages. That's why you need to it doesn't matter what age you are. It's way easier when you're younger. Obviously, you're going to have to get mini Dodge, learn Spanish real real quick. Well, fortunately, Haley, my wife, is fluent. She lived in Spain. Um, so she did this exactly what you're talking about. It's amazing. Yeah. So I'm really fired up about learning Spanish, right? It's, it's great. And I next, think it's going to be a needle mover for us. So I'm happy you're doing it. And next is Portuguese. I'd love to learn Portuguese because I want to go to Portugal. So I made a commitment next summer. Next summer, I'm spending in Europe. I'm doing it in Europe. We're making it. I told you this actually. Nine. It, it's basically even motivating me because I want to say I need to have everything dialed in my life so that in nine months I can go away for three months and nothing's going to flip upside down. Right. Because there's always excuses as to why you can't. There's always things holding you down. I'm going to have a Maine Coon cat by then. I spoke to the lady today. Good. She told me that my Maine Coon cat daddy mama is pregnant in four days they're gonna have babies wow so i would be getting a cat potentially in six weeks so that's exciting i'm excited I've, this house needs that this house needs an animal i can't commit to a dog but a cat you know a cat's the homie but uh i forgot what i was talking about. i was going with that um, got fired up spanish learning spanish is exciting because portuguese tobacco specifically is has a lot of it's it's from cuba cubans built the vibe it's when people think of tobacco they think of cuban cigars absolutely and and look you know we we, we have some great suppliers right but it would be amazing if we had the ability to control all of that on our side right and as you start thinking out like in the next three year five year ten year plan for the business that's absolutely something that is of interest to us is controlling that entire process from seed to finished product and right. hey, a gringo is going to get taken advantage in the market. But then if you know that Espanol, it's like, oh, wait a minute. That's dangerous. Wait a gringo a that knows fluent Spanish. Well, no. Here we go. Put me in, that coach. looks like you too, a Viking. <laughs> so, something was really funny. Um, that meme that, uh, Sky, you showed me about the classic white dude going to Miami. Uh, the New Yorker going to Miami, yeah. Starts off as just like clean cut. Next thing you know, the shirt comes unbuttoned. Next the button. hair gets longed. The fedora goes on. Mm -hmm. The chain comes out. Speaking of chain, so I've never been a jewelry guy. I actually own one watch that doesn't even have a battery, and I only rock it when it's when it's fresh. 
I have nice shoes. I have nice suits. I invest in suits. Uh, I love suits. Like that's my thing. But recently I was like, I need to get a gold chain, right? I need to get a chain. So I decided I want to get a four gram chain. Okay. Ray Blesser from Northeastern Fine Jewelers. Wow. Shout out. He found me this one. This is 3.5. So I'm happy I have a chain, but I don't think it's big enough. I think I need to get a little bit bigger. I think so too. I yeah, do. but I like it. It's I was fortunate now. enough. I, I wear my grandfather's chain. Um, and this is, this is, this was given to me when I was, I want to say 10, it went in a safe. Um, and then when I was 16 or 17 about to go to college, uh, I took it and I've been wearing it ever since. So I'm lucky enough to have that. I think Sky had that same thing. You got your chain passed on to you too, right? Yeah. It's a chain from my grandmother and then a pendant that my mom bought me and my brother. Nice. So it's got a sentimental value to me. That matters. That so if you matters. guys, if you guys don't have a chain like me, you go gotta to be the one that starts it. And you gotta go to Ray Blesser. You gotta go to Ray Blesser. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Ray Blesser is a good dude. Great guy. Great guy. Yep. Everyone knows his commercials. Mm -hmm. Built a business. And it's interesting when you grow up in any type of neighborhood, right? I, I remember growing up and used to see all the super fancy, nice houses. Cobble Hill Road in Loudonville, just gangster houses. Even when I was younger, I remember when I would go to someone's house and they had the thing where you could take your cup and put water right from the fridge. I was like, they must be so rich. Yeah, that is you know, There's certain indicators thing. that you thought people were loaded when you were younger because you didn't know anything about real estate in life. You're just a young kid, right? Yep. Gas ranges, gas up. You know what I mean? And that was a big thing. And then you learned that, oh, real estate's different depending on where you get it. You know, you can get a million dollar home in Miami. It's going to be a lot smaller than a million dollar home in Albany, New York. Mm -hmm. There's different value that's placed on different things. And it's interesting that the whole world and ecosystem is so big, which I think goes back to the thing that you need to see it holistically. And that's been the great thing about growing up and learning more and meeting cool people and having them on the podcast because you learn a little bit, a little piece of something from everyone you meet with. So yeah. you need to be intentionally ingesting knowledge at some way. And we've also lived in quite a few places too, right? I mean, we, we lived in San Francisco, San Francisco. for a little bit. We That's where you some, met Haley. Exactly, met Haley. Um, we had conversations in San Francisco about starting a business. That's when you were out there for, I think, I think you had just mentioned it earlier. Um, it was that 500 startup, startups. 500 startups. And by the way, Francisco shout out to you because I was staying in a hostel at the time. Again, I was making no money, right? Living in San Francisco, broke, which is chill. You can be broke in your early 20s, 20s. Like that's how life works. Like that's the time to do it. Be broke, live paycheck to paycheck, make it happen. But you gave me the keys to your $3,000 a month apartment for three weeks. And I appreciate that. Of, listen, of course. I mean, it's the least I can do. And I remember we had a rooftop that I never went on. The only time I ever went on it was with, with you. And we you smoked weed that night. And you say, come on, just let's go out there. It's the one time. Let's just go out there. And we did it. And it was amazing. And my wife was there too. It was Haley and I sometimes talk about that and reminisce that, that night because it was incredible. And I remember we said... We're going to build businesses. We did. We did. And that's what, that's what I mean. And now we're here full circle. We were talking about those things. We had the vision back then. That was eight years ago. But you can't force it, right? When it happens, it happens. And like, no timing matters. Like timing is very important. Like luck, timing, like all of that stuff is important. You can have as many skills as you want. You can understand a lot. You can have great knowledge. You could read up on everything. But if the timing's not right, or if you don't get lucky, or if like things don't fall your way, I mean, that's important. And you just got to keep at it because eventually those things will come together and the timing will be right. And fortunate enough, we, we were able to get to that point. Yeah. It's the journey, not the destination. Yep. You got to be stoked on the journey. I saw this, it's the Chris Pratt scene in a movie. I think it's shit. What's that movie? It's like a secret agent movie with uh, uh there's a scene with chris pratt and he's talking to the robot the robot waiter and he asks for something like super prolific or yes. profound for him to explain and he basically said something along the lines of you at you feel like you need to be somewhere it's that right there it's that that first it, passengers yeah it's the movie passengers yeah. hey, go back real quick sky it's the look at that image the top left image that's the exact scene um but he talks about Let's see, actually see if you can pull it up. See if you can find that scene about what he actually says to that because it's such a 
awesome scene. She's explaining. But he talks about the idea that if you could, right now you feel like you need to be somewhere else. And, but chances are that if you got teleported someplace else right now, chances are, would you still be happy? Mm-hmm. And most of the time it's not. And the reality is, is you need to live in the present. You need to feel present. I don't know if this is it. Yeah, it, live a little. Play it real quick. You gotta turn the volume up. The ship. I was all done. Even androids end up on the scrap heap. I'm your only customer. Why are you always polishing the glass? Trick or treat. Makes people nervous when a bartender just stands there. Yeah, I don't know. It's 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 later on. I don't know if we're about to rock this for two and two and a half minutes. I remember I remember the movie though. I and. I know but the mean. point is, is that you need to make the most out of where you're at, even though it gets challenging a lot. I want to watch this movie now, but uh, it gets challenging in life to be appreciative of where you're at. But something that I've been stoked on is the idea of the journey versus the destination. I can't wait for one day, five, 10 years from now, you know, all of the glory that's going to come to cigars.com in our, in our future. I can't wait. But it's these days right now where you're grinding, you're scrappy, you stay positive when you're cold calling and you get just shit on and rejected. It's these days when you're hustling, making vendor relations, speaking to investors, doing all these different situations, pivoting. These are the days we'll look back on. These are the days that are going to be fired up on because once it all goes away, we'll miss it. And you got to appreciate the grind. You have to appreciate being in a position where you're just hustling and growing. I think you should, if you can be comfortable in the uncomfortable, like you're going to be successful no matter what you do, right? Think of it in like as an athlete, like if you're not taking 2000 shots a day, right? Like, and it hurts, right? Then you're not getting better. Like to be comfortable in the uncomfortable because in business or out there on the field or whatever it is, you're going to be faced with things that you're not ready for you need to be able to adapt right also take the wins when they come and celebrate them but don't celebrate them too long right move on to the next ones but when they come enjoy them because like you said i mean they come and they go right and you look back on them and you'll appreciate them yeah drink the expensive bottle that's been sitting in your your closet yes. forever drink smoke that. the expensive cigar from time to time don't when wait. you're celebrating yep do enjoy. not enjoy yep live there's Life no goes time. so quick. We There's no better time than now. We just we were just talking about how quick just a year goes by. It's crazy. Life goes by so quick. That being said, should we smoke those gold cigars in the middle of this talk? Wow. Oh, this <laughs> twenty-four carat the gold cigars. The twenty-four carat gold cigars gifted to us by the one and only Jordan, Jordan Adler. Adler. Beach money. Jordan Adler gifted us these S- gold foiled twenty-four carat gold cigars. Still, and I, I still that beach money cigar is probably still one of my favorites. So even though the 24 karat gold cigar is quite expensive, I don't know if it'll taste as good. It's tough. It's tough. As the beach money. The beach money is very good. I don't know if we should smoke that one right now. <laughs> That's like, <laughs> I'm all about, we have to celebrate a win. We have a big win coming. We're close. We're close to a huge milestone that is exciting. And it's so exciting because I'm doing it with my favorite people on the planet. I was thinking about it today, living in Miami. Like, who are my top people? I think Da, like, Sky's my brother. You're my brother. Parzak's now here. Mike Parzak. I'm excited to see him tonight. He's going to be here tonight. It's crazy he's here. You got Drew Lasky's here now. It's like these people that we grew up with or the people that were, you know, friends from Loudonville. It's crazy that we're all so tight still. And I just appreciate that. Like, so cool. Obviously, there's been a lot of amazing people I've met. But I do find myself consistently hanging out mostly with the people we just spoke about. They're the realist, right? I mean, again, they've known you since you didn't didn't really even know yourself, right? So they've seen that whole evolution, been along for the ride. It's really valuable to have that. Not many people do. Yeah, there's a lot going on. And we've been talking now for almost an hour. Can you believe it? That's crazy. Wow. And we're actually, after this, we're building a laser. Yeah, there's a lot of great things that we're going to be able to do with with a laser, as you can imagine, <laughs> um, with cigars and custom cigars and boxes and accessories and all of that. So that will be that'll be the next that'll be the big next initiative for for our company. So stay tuned. Making it happen, Matt Dodge. Lastly, if you could go back in time and talk to the kid that was working at the Valley Cat Stadium. 
that was working his first role, working that first job. 34 year old you now about to be a dad about to be the daddy of little dodge beautiful home beautiful wife epic business good friends everyone's healthy great family what would you say to that person that could save you a ton of let's say time money heartache headache grief what would you say to that person i would i would tell that person to trust their gut if something doesn't feel right move on if something feels right double down um, and that goes for a lot of things. Like, you know, when I met my wife, I knew the second date that I wanted to marry her. But also on the flip side of that, when I started doing sports agency and I could start to see kind of what that world was like, I could have probably saved myself a couple of years of my time, you know, if I were to just pull up, pull back on that. So I'd say, trust your gut on both sides there. And when things are right and you feel it, like I did with my wife, double down on that, put it, put everything that you have into it. And I think it'll save you some time and you'll get to where you want to be faster. Matt Dodge, thanks for coming on the show, my brother. Thank you, I appreciate you.